Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us in today's uh, CSS lecture series entitled Investigahan, Financial Literacy, and Public Finance. This will be a two-part lecture series organized by the CSS Lecture Series Committee in coordination with the Bureau of Treasury and the Institute of Management. This two-part lecture series aims to deliver a series of lectures on financial literacy and investments with the goal of relating personal finance with the bigger picture of national government finance. Our resource speaker for this two-part lecture series, the first part which is today on May 20, and the second one being on June 10, shall be uh, Director Robert, Robert Dominic E. Mariano, who heads the research service of the Bureau of Treasury and oversees the provision of technical support to treasury operations and policy formulation. But before we start with the presentation of uh, Director Mariano, let us first play our recorded the recorded opening remarks of our Chancellor, Dr. Corazon Abansi. Good morning and welcome to today's seminar on Investing 101, a timely and relevant topic. Finance is the lifeblood of any organization and financial literacy is an important part of making the most of our precious savings. A World Bank study in 2018 showed that financial literacy in the Philippines remains low, with only 10% of Filipino adults able to correctly answer the questions on the topic. Study also found out that financial management habits formed during childhood tended to stay with us into adulthood. This means that if as a child we are raised with the right attitude and mindset about money and savings, we tend to be smarter about finances as we grow up. This is evident in our choices as consumers and how we plan for our retirement. Another World Bank study in 2014 found out that 20 million Filipinos save money, but not all of them had bank accounts. In 2015, a study by the Asian Development Banks said that our country did not have a national strategy for financial education. Education on investment avenues is vital. Some simply may not have heard yet of investment options, while some could know about it, but don't know how to proceed or which steps to take first. It is important that those of us who can invest should, and the misconception that we need a lot of money to invest should be broken. If we want to thrive in today's economy, we must challenge the status quo and get the financial education necessary to succeed. Today's seminar is our response in improving financial literacy by getting familiar with investing our precious savings. I wish you a productive activity this morning, and let me end by saying that a financially resilient citizen can be more productive, especially with the rise of digital transactions, and contribute more meaningfully to nation building. Marami salamat. Thank you for that uh, opening remarks, uh, Chancellor Abansi. Now, before we proceed with the lecture of our research speaker, allow me to introduce him more formally this time around. As I've mentioned, our research speaker for today and for June 10 is Director Robert Dominic I. Mariano. I already mentioned a while ago that he heads the research service of the Bureau of Treasury Department of Finance. He is also responsible for the conduct of market fiscal and debt monitoring and oversees the analysis and release of, of government fiscal and debt statistics. Uh, Director Mariano is also part of various interagency working groups, including those under the De Development Budget Coordination Committee, wherein he manages the drafting of the country's report on fiscal risk exposure. Mr. Mariano started his career at the Department of Finance as part of the Debt and Risk Management Office of the International Finance Group. Prior to working for the department, he taught economics at the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. Ladies and gentlemen, guests, 
Um, let us all welcome our research speaker for today and for June 10, Director Mariano. Director Mariano, are you there with us today? Oh, he's there now. Thank you, Director Mariano, for accepting our invitation. Hey, Sir Matthew, thank you very much. And uh, uh, I think it's an honor for us to be invited to this lecture series uh, hosted by the University of the Philippines Baguio College of Social Sciences Institute of Management. So um, let me just set up my slides before I uh, proceed any further with uh, the lecture for this or the talk for this morning. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, so the lecture series this morning is entitled Investigahan, and it seeks to deal with the fields, two fields, which are quite, uh, I think, related, but sometimes we, we just have to make that uh, connection. Uh, that is between financial literacy and public finance. Obviously, uh, one, financial literacy talks about uh, very micro behavior, how individuals uh, decide on their uh, financial goals and how to achieve them. Whereas the other, public finance, uh, is a more macro concept uh, dealing with how uh, the government um, conducts its fiscal policy um, and other related uh, functions. So the, before I start with uh, any of the, uh, before I proceed with the slides this morning, uh, I wish to provide a disclaimer. First, uh, by profession, I'm not really a financial advisor or a wealth guru. And the insights that we will hear this morning are not entirely my own. Just like most of you, I am also a uh, avid consumer of the innumerable tips and life hacks from the World Wide Web, especially from YouTube or Reddit. And what is different or what I seek to do today is to explore the similarities as well as the, some key differences between how we as individuals manage our finances and the government's fiscal management practices. As such, the points I will be raising today are my own and does not explicitly represent the views of the Bureau of the Treasury or the Department of Finance. So on that note, let me just talk about the mandate of the Bureau of the Treasury in case you're not uh, quite familiar about the organization. So the Bureau of the Treasury is an attached agency of the Department of Finance. Um, our motto is funding the Republic. We, the primary mandate covers three major operations. First is national government accounting. The, the Bureau is responsible for accounting uh, for all of the transactions of the national government. The Treasury also engages in asset, um, cash and physical asset management. Uh, we monitor the receipts and disbursements and make sure or we ensure that all uh, transactions are properly funded and that we have sufficient resources to carry out or to maintain the operations of the national government. Lastly, the Treasury also does liability management. In doing so, we conduct the borrowing operations both for the domestic and external, uh, or we borrow from both the domestic and external markets. Uh, weekly, we do the auction of Treasury bills and Treasury bonds as well as several special issuances, including the uh, retail treasury bonds or the premium bonds. So if you wish to know more about the, the Bureau of the Treasury, you may uh, look us up in the web, on our website or follow us in our Facebook or social media accounts. So let's begin. So to start off our investing journey, our, our investment journey, we, we need to acknowledge that we are all different. OK, 
Okay. And we have different backgrounds, different objectives, as well as different preferences in terms of how we manage our finances. In short, what works for me may not necessarily work for you. And this, of course, uh, is in line with that there is no one-size-fits-all solution to most of our uh, to most of the issues or matters that we uh, are uh, that we face, especially when we talk about finances. Okay, so usually when we hear or when we attend those um, some um, financial literacy talks, the speaker would immediately deal or go into uh, how one would invest or how one uh, should pick a portfolio, the composition of that portfolio, stocks or bonds or other assets. But I choose to start with the idea that um, some of us may have to first build a capacity to invest. Okay, But regardless of whether we are starting from a, uh, let's say, a break-even level or whether we are still starting out and uh, building our investment portfolio, we all, of course, by attending this talk, I assume that we have one common goal, and that is financial freedom. So financial, uh, in defining financial freedom, so again, um, I just Googled financial freedom, and basically, it is the capacity in terms of having savings, investment, as well as cash resources to afford a certain lifestyle or quality of life. Okay, And I think ito naman po ay common or uh, I think uh, something that we share uh, each and every one of us. Diba? We have this idea of uh, a certain uh, achievement that we wish to have by a certain age, right? Whether it's owning a house, and, uh, our own uh, house and lot, a, a car, um, being able to send our children to school or go on uh, even yung mga short-term goals such as going on vacations or affording yung ating mga uh, other um, uh, luxuries na gusto natin ma-achieve. Okay? But unfortunately, too many people fall short of this goal. Um, sadly, overspending, accumulation of debt, are constant is a constant burden, and this is more so when a major crisis disrupts all our plans, such as what happened during the pandemic. And let me just cite a few statistics. Okay, um, again, I took uh, this from a, another presentation which I was able to attend recently, and this just goes to this just attempts to show how uh, Filipinos, at least a majority of us, are not financially literate. Okay? So at least 75% uh, says standard and, standard and poor's. When, when we say financial literacy, this means that this pertains to the ability to understand and effectively use financial skills, including personal financial management, budgeting, and investing. So when we say that 75% of Filipinos are illiterate, it means that they lack the skills and knowledge uh, regarding financial matters to take effective action to achieve their personal, family, as well as community goals. So let's go uh, further down the road. From 75%, 80% of Filipinos don't budget. This is from Asian Development Bank. And unfortunately, if we look at 90% of Filipinos don't have savings. Okay, ito na rin po yung sinasabi natin na unbanked sector. Uh, the access to formal banking services. And if we, it's really a slippery slope coming from, uh, you, see, you see the pattern there, when you are financially iterate, uh, illiterate, you are not able to effectively budget and therefore uh, you don't accumulate savings and hence you are not able to realize a surplus to invest. 
In short, you're not able to make your money work for you. And lastly, because of this, 97% of Filipinos retire poor. Ito na po yung sinasabi natin na we are not able to achieve, or you are not able to achieve your financial goals. So we wish to address this. Uh, and of course, as part of uh, the national government, uh, there are uh, initiatives in place to uh, address itong mga serious uh, gaps na to in terms of financial literacy and skills. But this afternoon, or sorry, this morning, let us just go over uh, a few quick tips or sinasabi nga natin mga life hacks and how um, these are uh, largely similar yung ating uh, financial literacy uh, lessons with what is being practiced at the national government level. So the first path or the first uh, objective, of course, is to set goals. When we set goals or yung tinatawag natin ng mga life goals, it is basically working with the end in mind, right? You cannot undertake a journey without setting your bearings. You have to know what are the key uh, outcomes or uh, achievements that you wish to uh, realize and what are the milestones uh, to get there. And to do so, of course, it entails setting SMART goals. You know, yung mga sinasabi natin na specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, or realistic, and time-bound. And when we set our view, uh, the practice of setting SMART goals is to make sure that our objectives will be realized. Diba? As if it's not measurable, if it's not very uh, well laid out or specific, then um, you often lose sight of uh, what it is you seek to achieve, right? And then, of course, it has to be time bound. Otherwise, uh, there's there, there there isn't this sense of urgency, or you lose yung uh, steam along the way because it seems now you're just going on and on, but you don't uh, take into uh, or you are not able to realize ano yung mga uh, specific achievements mo na kinakailangan para marating yung uh, ating end goal. And so, this is also another thing na uh, I picked up in one of those uh, uh, lessons about investing. And that is to use your most important asset wisely. Can you guess what is that asset? That asset is time. Okay, so let me just say it again. Your most important asset is time. It's not money. Okay, money you can get. You, maybe you have, yeah, uh, you have some money now. You can get more in the future. But time, time is something that will always be uh, winding down. Okay, as you go on, as you uh, you progress from uh, your college years. To when you begin working, to when you start a family, time will all will inevitably march on. So when you're still young, or uh, I suppose some of our audience right now will be uh, students in college, you can consider yourself as time rich. Okay, and in doing so. You have to invest your time wisely. So, may sinasabi natin na uh, if you're going to um, start, or if, there's no better time than today. There's no better time to start investing or uh, gaining financial skills than today. Okay, so make use of your most important asset, which is time. So, switching from the personal goals. Let's see how this is mirrored at the national government level. Starting off with working with the end in mind. How does the national government uh, formulate its plans and its programs? 
It is, of course, guided by that overarching um, vision set out in the Ambition 2040. The Ambition 2040, as it was instituted in 2016, seeks to um, establish uh, yung tinatawag na matatag, maginhawa, at panatag na buhay para sa mga Pilipino come 2040. So you can think of it as a long-term goal. And it's outlined there. Matatag, maginhawa, panatag. To get to that long-term goal, as mentioned in the personal level, you need to set specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound goals. And that is where we break down the Ambition 2040 into increments. And these are mirrored in the Philippine Development Plan. The Philippine Development Plan is crafted by each administration to outline its approach in achieving the development goals, the long-term development goals of the country. The current Philippine Development Plan, uh, 2017 and up to 2022, is in line with the zero plus 10 point social economic agenda of the current administration. And well, by the way, all of these materials are available at the websites of the Nash, uh, of NEDA. Uh, you can download it there. So let me just briefly go over some of the points uh, raised in the Philippine Development Plan for the current administration. Um, uh, it mentions a 10 point social economic agenda. It includes Continuing yung macroeconomic policies, including the fiscal, monetary, and trade policies that were instituted uh, prior to the current administration. It's, it seeks to institute progressive tax reforms as well as effective tax collection, increase competitiveness and, and uh, sorry, increase competitiveness and ease of doing business, accelerate infrastructure spending which should account for 5% of GDP, promote rural and value chain development towards increasing agriculture and rural enterprise and other uh, investments in uh, human capital as well as social services. So under the current plan, the target is to reduce poverty from 21.6% uh, during the start of the administration to around 14% by 2022. So I, this is equivalent to lifting 6 million people out of poverty, specifically those involved in agriculture. So all of these um, objectives or goals set in, these, in, the, in the Philippine Development Plan are set out into specific strategies. Okay. So coming from that long-term, once again, uh, vision set out in the Ambition 2040, and we now move to the medium-term planning under the Philippine Development Plan. These are, this is further um, reflected, or the, uh, the priorities, the key priorities of the government is reflected in its annual national in its annual budget yung po yung tinatawag natin na general appropriations act or in GAA so we now see here the uh, progression of the uh, sinasabi nga natin planning or long term medium term and short term planning of the national government and since we are talking about uh, the annual budget, we go on to, or we can now move on to the second part or another point in uh, financial or another uh, financial skill for individuals, and that is setting a budget. So to make a monthly budget for individuals, of course, first, it's important to assess where are we in terms of our income and, and expenditures? They say that it's best to track your income and expenditures, let's say, uh, in whatever uh, means is available to us. Pwede natin yung isulat sa isang maliit na notebook, kung magkano yung kinikita natin, ano yung ating regular na pinagkakagasusan, whether it be 
yung ating mga uh, necessities as well as yung other uh, unexpected expenditures natin. And there are also, for those, I know that uh, ngayon very digital na po tayo lahat ngayon. So there are also, there, there are a multitude of apps out there that let, lets you track your expenditures, categorize them according to uh, specific classes, right? And also, uh, you are able to these apps as well, you're able to um, record your income from several sources as well as other assets that you may already have. So this is very useful in terms of programming yung ating resources. Next, so I won't go very deep into this 50-30-20 rule, but once you have your budget, meaning you have your income, you have your uh, projected uh, flow over, uh, let's say, a month, what is suggested by most is that you adopt a 50-30-20 rule. So the 50-30-20 rule mainly says, now let's start with savings, na after deducting uh, taxes, meaning yung, yung uh, what you call this, um, disposable income, Okay, after deducting your taxes, 20, you allocate 20% for savings as well as debt repayment. The 30% goes to uh, yung mga wants or yung ating mga, well, this will not be categorized as yung mga basic or yung mga necessities. Yung 30% na allocation na to is meant to make the budget practical. Most budgeting uh, exercises fail because they are not practical. Diba? Minsan, pag narinigyan natin yung word na budget, it's um, closely related to austerity. Pag titiped ka agad, we're cutting out all of the excesses. But there, parang ano yan eh, um, if you deprive yourself of this uh, 30%, or yung mga, at least ano, yung you basically try to reward yourself every now and then para naman you feel or you are able to enjoy yung iyong uh, achievements. And then lastly, the 50% is for fixed and basic expenses. Okay. Coming from this allocation, 50-30-20, um, you are supposed to build a what we call an investment fund. And that is how, you, from the 20% that you allocate or that you save, um, they say that first, you should have a standby fund. That uh, Basically, if you're going to put uh, it in a hierarchy, your um, regular expenditures, yung mga necessities, form the base. Okay? Those are uh, non-negotiable. Diba? Because those are basic needs natin. Um, water, electricity, shelter. Ngayon niya, nakasama na rin sa basic expenses yung internet connection. Isa siya sa mga unang binabayaran natin kasama ng electricity on a monthly basis. Now, after you have your basic expenses covered, you're supposed to have a standby fund. Now, most... Um, financial talks that I attended, um, uh, suggest a standby or emergency fund that is roughly equivalent to around 12 months of your expenditures. Okay, so I know major, it sounds daunting, right? Na parang how can you even uh, over or accumulate that much when you're just uh, saving just 20% of your monthly budget? Dito na nga po pumapasok. Yung sinasabi natin ang flexibility doon sa rule. Yeah, it's 50-30-20. But, of course, you can increase your savings. Um, and how can you do that? You, well, necessarily, you cut from your uh, non-necessary spending. And if you can save a little bit from the other expenses, then all the better, right? So, go from your basic expenses then have your emergency fund, and then the final portion or the final tip of that hierarchy is for investment. Okay? Usually, um, 
most in investing kasi there's a risk right inevitably there is risk uh, you don't realize returns if you don't take on risk okay basically you can think of yung mga return on investment as a reward for taking on a certain level of risk so bakit bakit nilalagay natin sa huling part ng hierarchy yung investing because that is where potentially you can realize losses depending on how you uh, constitute or how you um, build yung profile ng iyong portfolio so after you have allocated your budget you're tracking your expenditures on a daily basis you there you then assess your progress and adjust accordingly ito nga po yung sabi natin na okay um, actually i tried this and i would suggest that prior to our if you're going to attend our next session on june 10 you also do this as well try to keep track of your expenditures you'd be amazed at how much you spend let's say on uh, well right now we all know tumataas ang price ng gasoline <coughs> sorry and uh, another thing ngayon napaka convenient na ng mga electronic uh, transactions e transactions right so you're just transferring money from one bank account to your gcash account or using your gcash to pay for um Meralco, PLDP, loans, you're using it to pay for Jollibee or and such. But there's something I think na biglang nag rear or nag emerge when uh, during this pandemic or in this digital age, and that is yung mga transaction fees. Okay. If you're like me, na um you uh try to minimize these transaction fees right how do you how can you do that if you can project okay so that's a, a, that, that comes uh, uh, in line with your tracking of your income and expenditures if you can project let's say how much you gaga meet in musa um, if you're like me and you drive uh, outside metro manila you first meron kang mga rfid um, and alam mo na you'll be going back and forth Manila and let's say Laguna for five days. So you can already program how much you need in terms of your call fees. So pwede mo na siyang ipasok, if capable ka, pwede mo na siyang ipasok in bulk, right? One week at a time para ma-minimize mo yung transaction fees. Ganon din yung pag-transfer, transfer natin between, um, let's say, between uh, one bank to another platform, right? Let's say from your um, from your payroll account, your transfer to GCash, meron siyang transaction fees. So if we can minimize those transaction fees, iba, every little bit helps. So we need to assess yung ating expenditures and adjust accordingly. So that is from the individual side. Now let's look into how this is reflected on a national government level. When we talk about budgets at the national government level, we inevitably talk about fiscal programming. So when we say fiscal programming, it's not just expenditures. Just similar to the individual level, we are now discussing revenues, the expenditure, uh, and the expenditures of the government, and the resulting fiscal deficit. So the current administration has a 3% target deficit over the medium term from 2016 to 2022. The 3% of GDP, by the way, the 3% fiscal deficit is meant to accommodate more spending on social services and investment in infrastructure. This increases yung ating target from the previous 2% in the Aquino administration. In the early parts of uh, the current Duterte administration, 2016, 2017, 2018, we were fairly in line with that target. But come 2019, 
uh, of course, as our expenditures began to ramp, ramp up, our surplus or our deficit widened, and this was made even more, uh, or the deficit further ballooned, there, uh, I dare say, with the onset of the uh, current or the uh, COVID crisis. And why is that? The, the deficit, of course, uh, is just the difference between your revenues and expenditures. How did the, how did the health crisis affect the revenues and expenditures of the country. First, on the revenue side, economic activity was restricted, heavily restricted. People were not able to go out. Um, some lost their jobs. Um, some activities were, of course, affected by the lockdowns. So this took a toll on the uh, capacity of the government to raise revenues from taxes and other fees. Okay. And mayro pa tayong mga um, na uh, let's say uh, na encounter na instances wherein there were various concessions made uh, for the for the public since um, they may not be able to make payments let's say on uh, certain services so those were waived during the pandemic so aside from diminished revenues your expenditures also shot up, okay? The expenditures increased mainly because we had to support the economy. We had to provide uh, basic social safety nets, okay? And all the while, maintaining yung uh, priority projects and programs, particularly spending on infrastructure, since th these are capacity building uh, measures. So from 3.4% in 2019, the deficit or the fiscal deficit as a percentage of GDP increased to 7.6%, 8.6% in 2021. But for 2022, it is programmed to be reeled in to or around the area of 7.7% and to decrease down, uh, down the road or in the, in the subsequent years as part of fiscal consolidation efforts. This is necessary fiscal consolidation and reeling in new surplus or your deficit because we need to control how much we accumulate in terms of gross borrowing. Our gross borrowing requirement prior to the pandemic was uh, roughly around 1 trillion pesos. That was in 2019. And then suddenly it became 2.6 trillion uh, for 2020 and 2021. And that accounts for the ballooning of the national government debt, which we see in the papers. So um, it's around 12.7 trillion. Yeah, if I, I think roughly around that uh, level. So we see here that the national government, again, coming from that long term goal the planning that is in the Ambition 2040, the medium term program, the national government budget, coming from the plans that it has laid out, forms a fiscal program for the budget of the country to uh, achieve yung mga various uh, goals, which is engendered in the programs and the activities of the various national government agencies. And in doing so, we have to finance those activities. We have to find the resources to meet the requirements of those uh, activities. That is why we have a deficit, okay? Uh, meaning basically uh, we are not able to generate enough revenues to cover yung ating expenditure. And so we resort to borrowing. By the way, one thing that you will notice is that our borrowings are more or constantly uh, exceed the amount of the deficit. And that is because we borrow not just to cover the deficit, but we also borrow to service maturing debt, ito po yung ating debt servicing, yung mga principal repayments, and also to maintain the cash buffer of the national government. We have to have a standby or a, um, let's say, let's call this as the, uh, well, the general fund should not be uh, completely depleted. Of course, we have to be to make uh, 
uh, there has to be a sufficient uh, amount in, of cash uh, holdings of the, or assets of the national government to cover eventualities, as well as, of course, timing issues. Hindi naman, syempre, pag nag-cross over, let's say, yung 2022 to 2023, um, hindi naman exactly nagmamatch yung inflow ng revenues at saka yung outflows mo ng expenditures. So you have to have uh, carryover cash to meet yung early expenditures, especially since we expect majority of our revenues to come in around May, April, May, and so on. So since we are talking about uh, similarities between the national government and the individuals, might I just want, uh, let me just point out one key difference when we talk about fiscal programming. And that is in on the topic of savings, right? For individuals, we encourage, or it is in uh, most uh, financial talks, we'll of course start off by encouraging individuals to uh, increase their savings. But this is not the case when it comes to the national government. We have what is known as the paradox of thrift, okay? Basically, when we say the paradox of thrift, um, it posits or it proposes that savings or rather the uh, failure to spend is a drag on the economy. And if we are to follow certain schools of economic thought, in a crisis, a government should not be looking for ways to cut its spending. It should actually spend itself out of a crisis. How should it spend? We'll tackle that in the subsequent slides. But uh, suffice to say, one key difference when we talk about individuals and the national government, individuals are encouraged to save, whereas the national government is uh, the objective of the national government is to maximize the allocated budget because that has already been uh, programmed. The expenditures and the, 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 rev the expenditures that is outlined in the fiscal program is meant to support your growth targets of the national government. For instance, for this year, the, the growth target is seven to 9%. And if we take into account the 8.3, uh, target 8.3% uh, growth in the first quarter, despite, of course, base effects, then uh, we can expect naman na we are reasonably well, uh, or we are uh, on our way to attain yung 7 to 9% growth target for the year. So since we have talked about deficits, borrowing, we inevitably have to talk about the issue of debt. Okay. So debt, when we hear, uh, when we think, or when we even hear about uh, debt accumulation, it already has this negative connotation, right? Um, we are all, we early on, most of us, siguro sinasabi agad sa atin is to live within our means, uh, to only spend uh, what we have do not overspend, okay? But that may not necessarily be the case. So for individuals, the goal is to manage debt, okay? So take note of the heading. I, I, uh, uh, I uh, by design, I put there manage and not avoid debt. Okay, because there is a way to um, incur or accumulate debt responsibly. First is to spend wisely. Okay, do not, well, nakikita niyo yung progression, you plan, you budget, and then if necessarily, if necessary, you accumulate debt. But that debt is in line with a certain target. For instance, I know most of us uh, may not have the uh, capacity 
to let's say build our own homes from our uh, from our savings, our cash. So we go to yung mga institutions such as pag-ibig or yung uh, yung mga financial institute, uh, yung mga banks that offer housing loans, right? So the idea there is you have a goal, and based on your assessment of your expenditures, your revenues, and your cash flows, you can accumulate or you can enter into or uh, let's say incur debt that you're able to uh, pay off in a timely manner. Okay? And yan yung susunod na important part. You should pay on time. Okay? Particularly, very common nowadays na rin yung credit card debt. Right? So, when you have credit card debt, um, syempre meron kang monthly payments, make it a point that you are able to service your uh, credit card payments or your credit card debt. If you not completely pay off, at least pay more than the, minim than the minimum uh, payment. Kasi more often than not, yung nakalagay doon na minimum required or minimum payment required for a certain period just barely covers yung interest payments. Okay, to break yung cycle of debt, yung non-repayment ng credit card loans, you should pay as much of your principal as you can. And again, looking back to sa progression natin, that entails proper budgeting. Okay, Dun, when we say spend wisely, again, I referenced yung mga pag-ibig uh, loans or yung other uh, facilities that are offered to consumers, of course, those are very concessional. Kumbaga, mababa yung interest. Compared to, of course, hindi, uh, well, hindi naman siya talaga mababang mababa, but compared to other uh, other services, such as credit cards, which have uh, high interest, the credit card, uh, prioritize yung paying off yung mga high interest uh, loans Whereas yung mga concessional naman, you can reasonably service them and party yun dapat ng ating programming. And lastly, you can do active debt management as an individual. Um, if you are able to, let's say, uh, member tayo ng GSIS and previously you, uh, you took out a consolidated loan, um, then... GSIS came up, came up with this, uh, what you call this, um, multi-purpose loan. Uh, I, I forgot the proper name. But basically, they came up with another uh, loan facility wherein you're able to uh, refinance. When I say refinance, you have a out na loan, you took out another loan to pay off the previous one, but this time, the loan that you took on had a lower interest. Okay? Therefore, since mababa yung interest, you're better able to service yung, yung debt obligations. And then, at the same time, you freed up resources for other types of spending. Uh, another facility na in-offer ng GSIS, uh, I think this is more applicable to sa mga meron ng... Uh, to those uh, who are already working or uh, have already taken out loans with GSIS or other institutions, there was the GFAL, right? Now you are able to pay for uh, loans that you took out from other institutions using yung facility, yung GFAL facility ng GSIS. So that is an example of active debt management. Basically, if you are able to refinance your uh, current loans at cheaper rates, then that will uh, lessen yung burden on you uh, to service yung mga obligations nito. So, now, since we're talking about the burden of debt, coming from the individual, once again, uh, how it is mirrored in the national level, we often, or what is necessary when we talk about debt, is debt sustainability. Let me just 
show you yung progression ng ating debt as a percentage of GDP uh, starting from 1986. Okay? <clears throat> If some of you may ask why 1986, basically nung nag-implement po tayo ng database sometime 1993, all previous loans prior to 1986 were consolidated. So hindi po yan, uh, walang ibang consideration sa so, uh, pag-cut off at 1986. It was just a technical Uh, set up during that time. So what we see here in front of us or in the slide right now is the percentage of uh, or how much of our debt, how much is our, how much was and is our debt relative to our GDP. Our GDP, of course, the gross domestic product pertains to the total market value of your economy. All final goods and services produced within an, within an economy. Think of it as the well, the value or the assessment assessed value of your economy. It's a quick measure. It's not perfect, but it will do for our purpose. So, coming from a high of around 71.6 percent, this was around 2003-2004. I think this was the time when certain uh, corp public corporations yung kanilang debts were nationalized. Um, so therefore, it drove yung debt higher. Coming from 71.6% in 2003-2004, it reached a historic low of 39.6% prior to the pandemic 2019. And then, over the next two years, as we, again, in the fiscal program, Uh, realize a high level of deficit and gross borrowings to cover it. The debt to GDP increased to 60.5%. And as of the first quarter of 2022, it was recorded at 63.5%. Um, later on, if you have questions, we can cover that. Uh, but talking about debt, it's a whole other topic. It, Uh, usually takes me another hour or two just talking about debt. So let's proceed muna with our other slides. Okay? But if you have questions, you can post it in our, um, through our moderators. Maybe they can monitor yung ating Facebook or where, where are they, uh, where are they, uh, what you call this, uh, streaming itong feed na to. So we talked about how individuals can, as part of their exercise in financial literacy, uh, how they can uh, exercise prudence in managing their debt. Let us now look at how this is done at the national government level. First of all, debt management at the national government level is realized when we strategize the borrowing uh, or the, the uh, formulate the borrowing strategy, and it is meant to minimize cost and risk. Again, let me uh, emphasize that point. Debt management happens when you borrow strategically to minimize cost and risk. You don't minimize borrowing, because the borrowing is already predetermined by your fiscal program. Sa madaling sabi, if you want to be uh, really effective in debt management, you have to start with how you formulate the fiscal program. Okay? How we come up with the expenditures, how, uh, how it compares to the revenues of the government, and that is, of course, left in the hands of Congress. Congress is the one that formulates the national, formulates and approves the national government budget. So good debt management starts with sound fiscal management. Once you have that fiscal program in place, you now implement your borrowing strategy and your objective is now to minimize cost and risk. You are not controlling how much you borrow, once again, because that is already program. How you borrow is the essence of debt management. How you manage the profile of your debt. And in minimizing risks, 
Well, okay, let's begin with cost. To minimize costs, we have to be attuned to how the market uh, or what is the current environment in the financial markets. Right now, we are experiencing elevated levels of inflation. This is not just a local uh, phenomenon. This is happening globally, globally, and this is driving interest rates up. And so when interest rates go up, borrowing costs go up as well, right? Because uh, basically, yung mga nakita po natin na benchmarks, yung mga, uh, when you go to the financial markets and you, you see a yield curve basically showing what is the relationship between a certain maturity, tenor, and cost, those are set at the uh, option of government securities. We'll talk about it uh, in the subsequent session. Now, aside from minimizing costs of borrowing by uh, consulting or coordinating uh, closely with market stakeholder, stakeholders, the national government in our borrowing operations also manage risks. And what are the types of risks that we try to uh, mitigate? First, currency risk or yung tinatawag natin na foreign exchange risk. This, is, this entails your decision of whether you borrow from the domestic market or from uh, foreign or external capital markets. You wish to lessen Sorry. We wish to lessen yung volatility ng ating debt based on yung adjustments in exchange rates. So if we look at the fiscal program uh, that is available at the website of the DBM, you can look at the budget documents, particularly yung tinatawag na BESF, the Budget of Expenditures and the Sources of Financing. If you look at the D2 table, I think that's the financing table, you see na yung ating borrowing, yung breakdown, 80% or a majority of our borrowing is mainly targeted or we wish to borrow this from the domestic capital market and 20% from the external capital market. Next, we also want to uh, mitigate any refinancing risk. Bakit nagkakaroon ng refinancing risk? Based on maturity ng ating borrowings. You can either borrow short term or long term, right? The problem here is that if you mainly or if you are only able to borrow short term, yung repayment or yung pagbabayad mo ng utang na concentrate at a very short period of time. And the problem here, bakit siya tinag na refinancing risk? Once again, we are borrowing continuously to service yung ating mga nagmamature na utang. If at any point, you are not able to execute your borrowings, let's say, gaya nung 2008, na meron financial crisis, capital markets froze. If at any point, you are not able to borrow and you are left without resources, i.e. wala kang buffer, puti na lang meron po tayo, then nagkakaroon ka ng refinancing risk or yung chance na hindi mo mabayaran yung iyong outstanding and maturing debt. So, it becomes a, ano, uh, siguro nagiging, ano na lang siya, uh, moot na topic. Bakit hindi na lang long term, para long term ang ating pirami na utang para hindi na tayo magkakaroon ng refinancing risk? Well, that could be only, but the only problem there is that if you borrow long term, you now face the problem of higher borrowing costs. Okay? Between the choice of borrowing treasury bills, let's say three months, six months, one year, and the very long end of our treasury bonds, 25 years, if we borrow short term, yeah, it's low cost, but refinancing risk will be high because you'll be paying them off very quickly. If you borrow long, let's say 25 years, refinancing risk is low on the part of the national government, but for the lenders, let's say, kung kayo ay nag-invest sa government securities, if I were to borrow from you and say that I will be paying you back in 25 years, 10 years, 7 years, that is a 
depending on your tolerance, that may be longer than what you are willing to accept. And hence, since there's that added risk on your part as a lender, the investors, the lenders, ask for a higher premium. Do na po tumataas yung cost of borrowing when you go long term. Hence, it's a balancing act. It's a balancing act. Yung need mo for immediate funds and then yung ability mo to raise yung uh, uh, resources and of course to service yung cost of your borrowings. So those are just uh, two examples of risks that we wish to control when we execute our borrowing strategy. And also, we do proactive debt management. Similar to what I mentioned at the individual level, now if you're able to refinance your debt at a lower interest through, through several facilities, the national government also does uh, yung mga exchange or yung mga swaps, wherein uh, we offer yung mga new instruments at lower rates for those na holders ng mga maturing debt that may carry high interest rates. So instead of them having to, you know, having to look for avenues or channels to reinvest yung kanilang mga ano, yung kanilang mga holdings, sinasabi natin before maturity uh will ano, if you of course hindi naman to mandatory. Uh if you're if you choose to do so, you can take your current investment which is near maturity and put it in a new low cost but still relatively higher yielding instrument which is both favorable for the individual investor and the national government so i think um, this will uh, be just a few more slides before i close yung session one natin na to on uh, investing. Going back to the uh, debt to GDP ratio and how it has progressed throughout the years from a high of 71.6% and then to 39.6% in 2019. Remember that if we look at the deficit program, it shows you that Annually, there is an increment to your debt. Um, I fail to recall if ever there were any instance that there was a surplus. And even then, even if there is a surplus, it does not mean that you will be able to debt. Because, of course, uh, the only way for you to have a reduction in your nominal debt, the 12.7 billion, na yon, is when your debt servicing, magkaring binayaran mo, exceeds how much you borrowed. Right? So once again, from the deficit program, there's an annual increment to your debt. And yet, notice that from, 20 to, to, from the high of 71.6%, the debt to GDP ratio went down uh, until, well, uh, before the pandemic. So how did this happen? How did the debt to GDP ratio improve despite the fact that you are borrowing? The answer is faster growth relative to your debt accumulation. It's a ratio, diba? debt sa numerator, GDP sa denominator. Your borrowings is meant to finance your expenditures, your expenditures, as I mentioned earlier, is programmed to support your growth targets. And as long as you are growing, and that is faster than your uh, accumulation of debt, there are multiplier effects, basically, na, na -re realize Di ba yung GDP, basic GDP identity natin, consumption, investment, government spending. By realizing multiplier effects dun sa, uh, in, in, dun sa government expenditure which is funded by debt, we are able to improve yung ating debt sustainability. And furthermore, if there is a, if growth is robust, 
and it allows you to generate more revenues. Di ba yung revenue naman di ba? is a function of economic activity. Revenues, uh, let's say taxes, depend on how much, uh, how vibrant your economy is. So the more you grow, the more revenues you generate, the less deficit you incur. This improves your debt profile because you have less uh, borrowing requirements. So it is a virtuous cycle. Okay. So hindi po siya, um, hindi siya downward spiral as we are meant uh, some would uh, make us uh, imagine yung ating debt or fiscal management. Now, how do we uh, ensure now we are able to realize this? Of course, right now, debt, the debt to GDP ratio is going up. And that is inevitable. That is to be expected. The economy contracted. Expenditures were necessary to prop up the economy and, and uh, provide safety nets to the population. But how do we make sure or how do we regain yung momentum? Nato? How do we get back on track in terms of net sustainability? Sp by spending on key priorities. That is why we, we, we now look to, for example, we are in this transition period. We now look to the economic uh, Policies, who will be the key personalities that will make up the, uh, the economic team of the new uh, government. That will be crucial because we're coming from uh, a situation, a crisis situation, and we need to regain yung ating uh, momentum that was there prior to the disruption. Aside from that, uh, Aside from building on key priorities, you have to build capacity. That's why nagjana nga po yung uh, build, 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 build. Basically, uh, why invest? Why do we invest on infrastructure, infrastructure, and infrastructure? Because those are meant to improve yung um, potential output ng economy. You're building roads, connectivity, airports. You're also investing in. Okay, so. Most importantly, na dun yung investing. Okay? Right now, we are investing not just on infrastructure. We're also looking into uh, yung sa mga plans and programs in government, uh, covers yung programs for education. Diba? Nadyan yung free tertiary education. Nadyan yung investment natin on health. Um, Nadyan yung um, uh, uh, cash transfers, yung mga uh, four-piece program, which are meant to provide for basic services for marginalized sectors. So in closing, to regain or to ensure that we are sustainable uh, in terms of our debt, in terms of our fiscal uh, management, we have to be very prudent right now in spending uh, our resources. Maybe this will become a key phrase going uh, or in subsequent years, fiscal consolidation. Nandun po tayo sa period na yon. So with that, um, hindi naman sa ano, pero uh, I wish to uh, cut it na, uh, at this point since uh, we'll have uh, further discussions when it comes to investing on uh, the subsequent session on June 10. And uh, I turn you over to our uh, host, Sir Matthew. But before that, um, i just like to, uh, well, invite you if you'd like to know more about the Bureau of the Treasury to follow us in our Facebook account. Uh, you can find us at Treasury PH, where we also have a Twitter account. Um, most of most or all of the statistics that I cited is available in our uh, website, uh, www.treasury.gov.th, as well as the other uh, associated agencies of the national government, the DBM, NEDA, ESA. Uh, now more than ever, information is important. So if you wish to look into any of these topics, all of the resources are out there. So once again, uh, 
This is Mr. Dominic Mariano. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Director Mariano, for that very, um, it's a very, it's a very, it's a two-pronged approach. I noticed that at the start, you were discussing the personal finance really specifically. You mentioned how budgeting can be done at the individual level, and then you juxtapose this at the national level. And we saw, for instance, specific differences, for instance, the, the concept of uh, the paradox of thrift, where in the government, Rather than focusing on saving, the goal is to spend. To spend, the government should spend to get out of a crisis. So uh, we hope to learn more about this in the June 10, June 10 lecture. For instance, uh, there's a question that's being raised anonymously, sir. The question actually is that um, will the will the government uh, will the government securities uh, forms of Government securities for investment be tackled at the June 10 uh, yes. talk? Yes. Um, we will uh, talk about uh, the various channels available to, uh, to the public in terms of government securities. Uh, maybe we'll touch, uh, um, just uh, lightly touch on the other market uh, options out there since those will be covered by other uh, speakers and the resources are out there. If you are also interested on uh, government securities, you may download the app of the Bureau of the Treasury. There's a Bureau of the Treasury app, uh, the Apple Store or Google Play. You can also look for the, it's called Feely. Sorry, I don't have it in my slide like right now. It's Feely, F-I-L-I. It's Financial Literacy for Filipinos by Filipinos. Mm -hmm. It was developed by a team uh, here at the Treasury as well. So those will be touched upon uh, in the next session. Okay, thank you, sir. So I just noticed in our attendance, no, in our participants list, we have actually the vice chancellor for administration here this morning, uh, vice chancellor Ther uh, Santos Jose Odakanay. Understand that uh, Director Mariano is familiar with our vice chancellor. Yeah. So good morning. So um. There's another question here, sir, being raised. Since we mentioned the government uh, securities, um, is this where most of the most of the budget is being borrowed from? Because you mentioned a while ago, budget of expenditure sources of financing, that we actually borrow 80% of our financing in the domestic market. Is this the major source? Yes, um, if we look at the uh, the financing program, I think uh, well at, at least for 2021, it was. Uh, let me just call up my statistics here. But well, basically in the program, if you have uh, for let's say for 2022, the the gross borrowing will be roughly around 2.2 trillion. So you can expect that 80% of that will come from the domestic market. And this is meant to, again, uh, manage uh, foreign exchange risk. And in doing so, uh, by borrowing from the domestic market, we are adding the supply or we are injecting liquidity into the market. This will encourage trading of government securities. This will hopefully make the pricing, since you are trading, somebody's buying, somebody's selling, there's a market transaction and the price is reflected in that deal, that price becomes a benchmark. So the more trades happen, the more efficient the pricing of your uh, securities in the market. So by borrowing in the domestic market, yes, we are funding the, the requirements of the government. We are also setting up benchmarks so that the private sector can do their own borrowings. So for example, when we issue a 10 year, makikita ng private sector, ah, the government sector borrows 10 years at, let's say, 6%, then the private sector can do their own borrowing at, well, a, 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 little, a little margin above 6%. And that is meant to encourage private sector activity. Siyempre, in private sector, they do their own financing. Yung mga naggagawa ng tollways, toll roads, iba yung mga nag-undertake yung mga SETEX, yung mga TPLEX, mga ganon, minamatch nila yung kanilang projects 
with similar long-term financing. And it is through government borrowings that they are able to find the efficient price for their uh, financing transactions. Mm -hmm. I, I just found it surprising, I guess, same as the, as the one who asked the question, because we have this assumption that most of the most of the funding of the government is borrowed externally. I, I didn't know myself that we borrowed mostly from the domestic markets. I was surprised. Yeah, actually, we have been uh, what we call redenominating our debt. Currently, our debt is around 30% external and 70% domestic. Ito yung outstanding. Siyempre yung financing, yun yung dumaragdag. The more that you borrow from the domestic market, yung share dun sa yung outstanding debt, yung 12.7 trillion, yung around 70% of that is now domestic. 30% external. Mm -hmm. When we borrow external, we mainly prioritize what we call concessional loans. Ito yung mga program loans, project loans, coming from development partners. Development partners such as ADB, um, World Bank, uh, na yung mga bilateral partners natin, JICA, uh, Japanese International Cooperation Agency, and other bilateral uh, development partners. We, we prioritize yung mga debt coming from those uh, partners, uh, mga donors, because they are concessional in nature meaning lower than market price uh, market uh, market rates and then the balance we borrow from external markets through our issuance of bonds we issue global bonds we issue dollar bonds euro bonds panda bonds which is uh, basically u1 uh, denominated renminbi we issue samurai bonds meaning uh, yen in the same way na sinasabi ko nga na by issuing in the domestic sphere we are building a curve, an efficient curve, when we when we borrow from key partners. Ito yung mga economies na meron tayong significant exposure. We are opening channels. We are maintaining a foothold na should we need it, we are able to tap into those markets since meron tayong presence. Okay. I'm quite excited to learn more about those uh, treasury bonds and those kinds of bonds at uh, the June 10 uh, lecture goes. I always I always see that as well at the Department of Finance, the Bureau of the Treasury website, where you offer premium bonds. And that's the thing, if I'm not mistaken. And I try to look into it, but I'm one I look at the I look at the um at the rate of invest, the, I mean, the interest rate. And sometimes I'm debating, oh, it's quite, it's only a few in percentage larger than some banks, but what but can you say about that? But the thing here, kasi, first of all, when you invest in government securities, it's like savings already. It's it, it's different from when you say, when you invest in equities, now let, when we say equities, stocks. When you invest in stocks, there's a chance for you to lose. Right? When the market goes bad, uh, prices go down, uh, there's a market run or uh, there's a flight to safety, investors pull out, prices go down, there's a chance for you to lose. When you invest in government securities, government securities are fixed rate instruments. So if it says 3% for five years, it will be 3% semi-annually, quarterly, over the duration of that bond. You do not lose. The only chance for you to uh, realize losses is if you terminate your investment, let's say you sell, because you have to sell in the secondary market. And if it happens now your bond is trading below your market price or your, your buying price, then that's when you realize losses. But the rate itself is fixed, so it shall fluctuate. And since it is very safe, think of it, you don't compare it to uh, stocks or yung ibang uh, risky na instruments. Let's compare it to similarly safe channels such as, let's say, deposits. Deposits, we know, net you a return of less than 1% mm -hmm. on, your, on your deposit. Basically, your money is not earning. If you put your surplus, yung hindi mo gagamitin, into a three-year bond or a five-year bond, you earn 3%. And for the risk that you're taking in, yun nga eh, uh, you equate returns with risk. Okay? 
yung mga nakikita mo na high returns, not all, but most of the high returns being offered, yung profile nung instrument na yun or security or uh, investment may not have the same safe uh, rating or safe na profile ng government securities which have a higher return. And also, uh, uh, incidentally, you mentioned about uh, uh, the premium bonds. The premium bonds is part of our uh, what we call our retail offerings, meaning it has been scaled down to make it very accessible to the public. Yung mga RTBs, uh, for a minimum of 5,000, you're able to invest already. The premium bonds takes it down a notch, higher or lower. Because from 5,000, you're now able to start investing for as little as 500 pesos. Okay, so ito yung maganda sa premium bonds. You invest 500 you collect quarterly interest, and then at the end or at maturity, which is just one year, your investment goes back to you. But it does not stop there. Kaya siya tinawag the premium bonds is because quarterly, you have the chance to win cash and non-cash prices. During the last run of the premium bonds, I think 2020 up to 2021, there was yung pinaka malaki yata na naibigay namin, which is yung 1 million na cash price matched by a 6 million donation by our donor agency, donor partner institution. So in one draw, we were able to award 7 million pesos, if I'm not mistaken. So think of it this way. Parang tumaya sa loto, yung tinaya mo, nag-earn ng interest, after one year, yung tinaya mo, babalik sa'yo. So, hindi siya nawala. Tapos, may chance kang manalo. At hindi pa siya tapos. By investing, you are funding the program of the national government. So, you are not just investing in yourself, you're investing in the country. So, it's a win-win situation. And again, higher returns relative to savings. But, it is a special issuance. If you want to learn more about that, follow us in our social media accounts. Okay, thank you, sir, for that. I hope these things should be tackled as well at June 10 as uh, some of our attendees are asking. Since we're almost uh, reaching time limit, 12 o'clock, I guess uh, we'll have to postpone the other questions that were being faced or being asked by some of our attendees anonymously. Um, if you have other questions, please uh, reserve them because we will still continue this uh, lecture series to, at June 10. At June but, 10, uh, yes, yes, sir. But perhaps, Sir Mati, you can send it to us so that we can prepare for the questions or we can just do a quick recap next time and set the ground for the discussion so that we know kung ano yung appreciation ng mga tao, ano yung mga interest nila. Please send it to us if you have any questions to Sir Mati. Okay. So thank you po, Director Mariano, for entertaining that. No? So we'll just we'll keep that in mind. We'll have the questions prepared and sent for the June 10 um, re reply or response. So to close our first lecture series, oh, before we close, no, just a reminder, for our attendees who would like to have a certificate of attendance, please uh, do not forget to answer our evaluation form, which is already posted at our, at our chat box, set already to everyone. So again, please don't forget to answer our evaluation uh, form, Google evaluation form, which is already found it at our chat box sent to everyone. So before we end, let me call the Deputy Treasurer of the B uh, Bureau of the Treasury, Attorney Erwin D. Santa Ana, to have the closing remarks for this first uh, part lecture. Um, Deputy Treasurer Santa Ana, if you, if you will, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Um, ako po katulad ni, ni Director Bariano and uh, I'm, I'm doing this closing remarks on behalf of uh, Treasurer Lea De Leon. Kami po ay mga scholar ng bayan din. Kami ni Treasurer Lea ay uh, produkto po ng School of Economics sa UP Diliman. Uh, she would have wanted to be here um, uh, to personally address you, but of course, we know uh, how, how busy the National Treasurer gets. 
Um, to, to close this event, um, we thank uh, the Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Corazon Abansi, and I understand that the Vice Chancellor also is here uh, together with the, the faculty, the officers of, of uh, UP Baguio, and of course, uh, as, uh, the students who are present here today for um, allowing the National Treasury to work with you towards strengthening our country's financial literacy and inclusion. Um, ito po talaga ang uh, advokasiya ng, ng Bureau of the Treasury, uh, considering that we see that the retail segment of, of, uh, of the market no, uh, is actually a primary driver in the fundraising that we do for the national government. Um, our mandate here at the BTR is to fund the Republic, be it monitoring uh, uh, our collections from BIR and BOC and from the borrowing operations, market-based borrowing operations of the national government. And it is through uh, the domestic funding exercise that has been mentioned in the Q&A portion that we source the most funds for the Republic. In fact, last year it was eight, about 80-81% source in the domestic market. And this year we're looking to also um, uh, raise 75% of our funding through the local market. And just another bit of information, um, all outstanding government securities issued, a third of that is actually raised through retail offerings, through the retail treasury bonds, through the premium bonds, through the retail dollar bonds. So we can say that the retail segment is really robust here in our country. And this is actually a, 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 a case, no? a study uh, matter for, for the international community as well. Why is the Philippines uh, retail segment very vibrant? That's something that uh, the international community all, already recognizes at this time. Um, not only we are teaching uh, the, the, the Filipinos no, to, to learn how to save and invest, but uh, not only here in, in, in the Philippines, but we also reach out to our overseas Filipinos. Uh, so in the last offerings that we had, um, we have reached out to about 70 countries uh, through app-based mobile uh, you know, investing. Uh, we have reached out to several thousands of, uh, of uh, new investors. So that just goes to show how deeply rooted that, that, uh, that retail, retail uh, demand is. Um, we, I've already highlighted the, the critical role of the youth uh, in, in continuing the mission uh, of this uh, fundraising exercises. And of course, um, developing, uh, helping fund the development projects of the government. Um, we re certainly recognize that education is one of the most critical components of nation building. And it is our hope that through the series of online financial literacy, se literacy sessions, each of you will learn more about what you can do for, for our nation and, and of course, um, for your more financially secure future. We are grateful again uh, to, to, the, to UP Baguio uh, for, for committing to be the pioneer uh, educational institution for this initiative. I know many other universities will, will follow suit. Uh, I'm hopeful that this will be just the first of many sessions. There's a June 10 setting already, I, I understand. Uh, and that with our partnership with UP Baguio, we can make this initiative more widely known and accessible to the Philippines educational community. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I forgot to mention the, the Management Economic Society and all the persons who have helped this, uh, uh, to make this event possible. Maraming salamat po and see you again in the next installment of the program. And just like you, uh, we are happy as a community, uh, UP community 
for for our championship of of the UP men's basketball team. I just had to mention that because Treasure Lea and I are avid followers of the team. We we watch in venues and uh, we can't help but be happy about what uh, about uh, uh, th this this uh, championship after 36 years. Congratulations to all of us and thank you again and have a blessed day everyone. Thank you, uh, Deputy Treasurer uh, Erwin Santana, uh, si attorney. Uh, before you leave, before our panelists leave, perhaps we can have one uh, panel of, a of just a photo for the first session. So I'll just do the print screen. Po. Okay, so for the first session, one, two. Okay. Uh, wait, po, uh, I have to just save this one. Okay, so thank you po again for our attend for our participants who has joined us this morning. We hope to see you again at June 10, at the June 10 second part lecture, wherein uh, Director Mariano will be delivering the second part more about the public finance and how again uh, we can benefit from this. So again, thank you everyone and see you at June 10. Salamat po. See you po. Thank you po.